So, okay, so now I get video. Now, how do I use it to its best? Now, how do I build it into all my marketing mediums? How do I think about streaming? How do I think about doing something that is, is going to get the attention of these audiences in a way that my competition might not? Because if we can't keep doing the things we've always done. Hi, and welcome back to SaaS Half Full, the only show serving B2B SaaS marketers. I'm Lindsay Groper, president at Last Media, and as always, I will be both your host and bartender today. So for many of you SaaS marketers, content is king, and it has been for a really long time. But how do you think about video content? Based on my conversation today with Jennifer Smith, the CMO at Brightcove, she believes that every SaaS business, large or small, should be thinking more like Netflix and thinking and acting more like a media company. So if you care to, grab a drink and join me as I speak with Jennifer from Brightco. Hi, Jennifer. Welcome to SaaS Half Full. Hi, Lindsay. Thank you for having me. I'm excited to have you on the show. Where are you based? Where are you sitting today? I'm sitting in an extremely snowy Concord, Massachusetts, which is in the suburbs of Boston. Although you can tell by the accent, I'm not from here. I'm British originally, but... Lived in Boston for 13 years. Where are you from originally? I am from the northeast of England, a very little town in between what is known as Newcastle and Durham, and um, then went to university in London and then found myself here. Uh, Well, are you joining me for a drink today? I know we sent you a cocktail kit. Cheers, and thank you very much. Absolutely. I'm going to open mine here. I'm going with a seltzer. We just got a brand new beverage fridge in our office. So grab the first thing I saw, which is Ranch Watcher, which is actually one of my favorite seltzers. But excited to talk to you today. We are talking about a topic that is near and dear to your heart, which is why every brand, big or small, should think and act like a media company. So excited to dive into that. But before we do, I want to give our listeners a bit of insight into who you are, how you got to be CMO at Bright Cove. How did you get into B2B SaaS marketing? Was this intentional, accidental? What was your path here? Totally accidental. I was actually a linguist at school. So I studied French and German. I actually lived in Germany. When I left university, I took a job with a software company because I was dealing with their Eastern and Central European partners. And so never thought I'd go into marketing, although I did study it. But then I got to know the marketing manager and got to go to events and got really interested in it. And then that's where it went from there. And I was lucky enough to work for some amazing marketing leaders that taught me pretty much everything I know. And is this your first CMO stint at Brightcove or have you been a CMO previously? I have been a CMO previously. This is my sixth CMO role. Wow. That is impressive because I feel like the CMO is the hardest role in the C-suite. I think it's harder than the CEO. It has a lot more challenges and pressures and things that dynamically change from quarter to quarter, year to year. So the fact that you have opted in six times for this role, I personally think is very impressive. Well, I would say nothing's harder than a CEO role. I will give that, especially CEO of a public company. There is a lot to juggle with. What I love about the CMO role is that you get to be in between all the different teams. So I always say to anybody, if you think marketing is a department, you're wrong. It is a discipline. And if you don't like working as the kind of middleman between connecting all the dots, then you're in the wrong place. If you think you're going to get a ton of credit for stuff, then you're also in the wrong place. (laughs) But you're going to have the excitement of getting to work on both exciting tactical things, strategic things, and just helping shape it and pull it together. And that's what I love about it. Yes, indeed. Not a department. Huge responsibility. Am I right to say that you have worked with CEOs who thought they understood marketing and didn't and that that was a challenge? Yes. Um, CEOs, sales leaders who, you know, marketing, it it is a nuanced function and it's not easy to market. And people think it is because they think it's all about creativity. And when people think about marketing, they actually think about, oh, how fun it would be if I was creating adverts and TV commercials for the Super Bowl and all of that. And isn't that great? And isn't it all just wonderful? And it's actually really hard in B2B. It is really difficult to get your voice heard. 
It is complicated. The technology is complicated. Getting your message spot on is complicated. Understanding your competitors. And so it, it's not just about, oh, can you put out a campaign and drive me some leads because we really need to build our business. There's so much more goes into it. And I always say that every CEO wants something different. And it's really about, it's like a marriage, right? You have to figure out what's the yin and the yang and what do you bring? And you're not right for every single CMO role. And that's something that I've learned. It's really about finding where you can bring value and where your sweet spot is and what the company needs. Yeah, no, that that's great insight. And, you know, maybe it was all fun and creativity before there was a thing called metrics and analytics. Wait, you put the thing out and then everyone said, good job. And there was really no tracking or analytics behind it. But that is not today. And we've come so far that you believe everybody should think and act like a media company. Does this conversation, though, really contain to those larger companies that have big marketing budgets, large teams, or is this really for anyone? I think it's for everyone and it's more about content. So when we say think and act like a media company, we don't mean in the spend and how you put messages out. We're talking about how you think about content. So today, all marketeers spend a lot of time creating content, all kinds of content, written content, mostly and a lot more now video content. But we don't necessarily measure content in a sophisticated way. We measure tactics. We measure like email, campaign performance, syndication, events. But the actual content performance, and if you think about a media company, like think about Netflix, they live and die by how many subscribers they've got, right? It's all to them. There's a dollar value to everybody that comes to Netflix. And if you continue to subscribe, that's worth revenue. If you don't and you go away, then that's revenue lost. And so what they're serving up to you and the things you're watching and making recommendations is looking at your profile of content and then serving you up what you need. And that's what I mean when I think and act like a media company. Like, Think about your most loved app that you use, whatever it is, and think about how they're always changing. Like nobody's feed looks the same. And that's where we should be thinking about content and understanding what our buyers are consuming or are interested audiences are consuming and then make sure the content is hyper relevant for them and that's challenging because it means that you've got to be you've got to know them you've got to understand the data and then you've got to create the content that works for them so that i always talk about measuring the consumption of content as opposed to just the click through like really what's the attention index of somebody watching like how many people watch this entire podcast right till the end so that's what we want to know, not just watch 10% of it. Don't just open it, but actually consume it. And so that's what we say when we talk about thinking and acting like a media company. So media companies exist to create content to make money. That's what they do. So what are marketers getting wrong? I mean, one thing that comes to mind is just thinking about content one dimensionally. I make that mistake too, with I think content, and I think written content. And do you find that that is something that, that marketers get wrong consistently? Yeah, I think, look, written content has its place too, although we are seeing more and more all that long form and white papers not getting as much interaction. But people think about video content as that one-off, oh, I'm either going to create my big promo video that I'm going to pay an agency for, and therefore I can only make one or two of them a year. Or they think, oh, well, it's, it's, it's basic product level content. I'm going to do that whiteboarding where I'm going to tell things, people about products. And if you think about the way the world works now, think about all our social media channels, right? Think about everything, all your social medias. That's all user-generated content. So we should also be thinking about having our customers generate content, having our employees generate content, and having ways in which it can be created really easily, uploaded, given permissions, rules as to who can approve and send, but not thinking about always that high value, high cost, because it, it doesn't always bring that high value. It's, it takes so much to create it. Do you think about how much time it took? Oh my gosh, I mean, like if you're doing a sales kickoff, we all spend so much time doing the opening video for a sales kickoff, using agencies and, you know, or a big event. And you spend, if you're doing an event, how do you take a session 
and then cut that up, slice that up, use it for social media, use it on your website, use it for email nurture campaigns. So I think the use of video content has changed and we need to think about that differently and think about repurposing and then how we distribute that. And that makes content more valuable and has a greater ROI. I saw in a, a different interview you gave that you have a teenage daughter. So do I. And I think about the ultimate video consumer and low attention span in it, it. There is. It is your teenage daughter. Uh, how old is yours? It's interesting. So I have a 16-year-old girl and then I have a 12-year-old boy. And I would actually say the 12-year-old boy who is a gamer, a big gamer, that has opened my eyes to the world of audiences and how people consume and how people transact, like buying things. I was at CES and somebody had a quote that there's a very high value company um, that make more revenue off goods sold Roblox than they do on their website and in their store. I mean, think about that. And I'm telling you, my son would buy any of that stuff. He'd be, I want my V-Bucks. How do I get this? It's like, the world is changing. Where people go is changing. Anna Grande made more money on a concert with Fortnite than she ever did in person. And she spent right. far less time doing it. It's so interesting when I look at the 16-year-old and how she consumes content, even schoolwork, looking for colleges, it's all video. But then the 12-year-old, his habits are different. And that's what's going to happen to our audience. Their buying habits will change. And so we do have to think about where are they going to be and how do we get to them? And, and it's not through a white paper, that's for sure. No, uh, it, you know, certainly how they will eventually consume content will, will change as the platforms change. However, the thing I notice most is, is the attention span. They're not going to sit down and, and watch a 30 minute instructional video. It's in little tiny sound bites. It's always a person. There's typically a talking head. But a lot of times, too, is I'm finding out information from talks that she's watching and Instagram yeah, stories that yeah. she's watching and she's showing to me. But that is that very high impact, but short user generated content that you talk about. But yes, I know all our SaaS marketers are listening. They're like, oh, that's great, Lindsay. But who's going to buy my inventory control management software on TikTok? Like, I, I agree with everything you're saying, but are my buyers there? What say you? Yeah. So I would say, and, and actually, and I love talking to fellow CMOs about this. I was on a, a CMO huddle last week and we were talking about this attention deficit and somebody said, but there isn't a deficit to go and sit and watch a three hour movie that you want to watch. Like it's not really attention deficit. I think it's time deficit. And so both my children will sit and watch something for a long time. I mean, these YouTubers, those go on for minutes. They're not 30 seconds. So it's for the short and the long, but it's more about how you engage with them. And so if we're thinking about B2B buyers, it doesn't need to be short. It can be a product demo, but it's somewhere that's actually giving tailored, personalized and valuable information. So maybe it's a product update, but what does that mean? It's not just a product fact sheet. Can you have a customer come in and talk about it? Can you add interactivity into the video so somebody can ask a question directly? Or so there's ways we have clients in the pharmaceutical world, which fascinates me because they will say, people now want to self-inform. They want to know what is this drug? What is this procedure? Can you believe it? Videos are the way they want to do that. Like you get on and you see. And so that's very different. I think there is a place for it in every industry. It's about figuring out what that looks like. And when you talk about a you know, very tailored experience, when I think about the traditional marketing funnel, that tailored experience tends to happen closer to the bottom as opposed to the, the wide, broad swath of awareness at the top. Does using videos or shake up that traditional marketing funnel? And where do you see it being most effective? Yeah, because I think we've gone from being the funnel being like this, where we were super wide at the top and narrow at the bottom to actually being the other way around. Because what you want is to know, well, my target audience is these people, these companies, but I want my revenue to be bigger. And so the notion of a lead is also to me like 
that drives me crazy. Like, so, okay, so somebody comes on your website and happens to fill in a form, which nobody fills in forms anymore. But if they did, that's one person. And that company probably has 10 people that are going to do 10 things within the buying cycle. So actually what we need to do is just know that we've got these 50 or 100 companies, put multiple people in them and look at what the needs of those people are. So they might be in automotive, they might be in pharmaceuticals. So there's one segmentation. Now they might be the head of communications. They might be the marketing, the digital marketing head. They may be in a media company, the person responsible for subscription versus advertising revenue. So you start breaking those down and start thinking about where have we got content? And that's where you need to create a lot, right? You need to, you do need a lot of content. So we have a channel and we talk to, we have a lot of customers that are now building channels, right? So like you wrote Netflix channel, it's called Play TV. It is where you can find all things video. We have hours and hours of video library on there. It's not all sourced, but it's not all us. Sometimes we are in sourcing content that is relevant for video production, but we haven't created because it's relevant to our audiences. Or we have thought leaders or speakers or customers do things. It's not all bright code generated. But it's all around where somebody is in that buying stage and what might be useful to them. Some of it's quick, some of it's more long form. But that channel allows us to deliver that content in a really nice, user-friendly, kind of media-centric like way. And then I run reports of, well, what does that look like? So what does the consumption of this profile look like? And what should I be serving them up next? And we are finding much greater engagement on that than we ever do now on our website. It's just where people want to go. We're seeing a much higher subscription rate there than I'm seeing growth in my website visitors. Can you talk about creating a lot of content, hours and hours of content from a video standpoint, is who all needs to be involved in that process? You constantly hear about how marketing is creating stuff that they think sales wants and sales never uses it or does goes rogue and uses their own Frankenstein version of it. Who should be involved in this process? Like who should really own the video creation process or not even grab video creation process because so much happens, the ideation phase before that, but like who owns that and who ought to be involved? I mean, I guess that's different in each company, but the most productive way for me, and I've learned this over the years is everything has to start with the audience and your value prop and your value to them. And so actually getting agreement first on, look, this is who we are selling to. This is why we think we bring value. Here's some evidence we have of that from other customers. Are we all in agreement with that? And that is what we call the start of the go-to-market process, which is actually a big consolidated team between product marketing, SEs, sales, anybody that's really taught customer success, understanding what that means to a customer. And then from there, we think about, well, what kind of content do we need? The other thing that we see a lot of is there's a lot of companies now buying video platforms like ourselves for internal purposes, not just for being able to market out, but to be able to have content shared between sales and marketing, for example, where sales could be engaging with a piece of content and actually want to create some feedback, want to upload that or make some comments to, to edit in it, that is also extremely valuable because that back and forth, that comes back to the age-old question of the sales and marketing engagement. You can't just be creating things and throwing it over the wall and hoping that it works. It's a waste of money. It really is. And so I think it comes down to the relationship rather than who owns the actual creation of it. To me, marketing leads that go-to-market process, and part of that is determining value, determining audience, and having a team work together. And if I'm a company who traditionally hasn't invested or used video as a strategy, and I don't have, have the equipment, I don't have video production equipment, like, what is it, what's acceptable? I mean, can I be shooting video with iPhone? Does that work? Do I need, do I really need to be invested in the equipment? I guess that's part one of my question, and part two What's realistic turnaround? Because another thing I hear from sales is, yeah, that was relevant six months ago. But now that it's undergone the whole oh, yeah. process, not, by the time it's gotten to me, like this is no longer relevant. So just like expectations around quality and what's needed to even have valuable video content. So if you look at some of the very large consumer companies, they're very lucky because they have whole teams and production studios who do this full time. 
they are lucky because they have that. I have two videographers in house. We purpose built a small studio. And so we're lucky to have that. It's not huge, but we're lucky that we can actually do some recordings. And I have the videographers so they can do the editing. But we still use agencies and we actually use other third parties where we might just pull in some relevant um, imagery or where we're missing something in a certain. In, and there are a lot of sites out there and people you can work with where you can get that kind of content. I would say that agencies need to think about video production be being easier and less expensive because when you go to the big marketing agencies, it is a process and a cost to get something really well done. And you need to your point, you just need to be quicker. We can create a video in two weeks, right? We can turn that around. And, but what we do do is we take content we've already got and we might be slicing. We might be saying, well, this is great. We can use that first 30 seconds, but now it's relevant to this industry. So now what do we have for that industry? And so it's the repurposing of that content and always thinking about how you can create some video out of it, that it doesn't need to be timely and expensive. I do think that the resources are important and that we're going to see a rise in more companies needing the video resource. A lot of companies buy, have writers, right? They hire writers and copywriters, which is great. But I think we're going to see the same thing when it comes to video skills. So that's just the, the first entry point on what do I need in order to create decent looking, effective, valuable video. Outside of though, putting it out into the wild and looking at view, do you have to build like eventually an entire video marketing tech stack as part of a subset of your marketing tech stack? How do you eventually harness really the value of and understand the effectiveness of video content? As all marketing is known now, the marketing tech stack is more complicated. There is not one solution that solves all of our problems. I love working at Brightcurve because we integrate with and work with all of the marketing technology solutions out there because you need, you need a group. You need your marketing automation. You obviously need your sales force or your sales automation. You need some kind of intent scoring solution, right? That's a must now. We believe you need a video solution because otherwise, where do you manage all your assets? You might have a dam, you might have a content management, but the management and distribution of the video out of that and streaming, you can actually run your own streaming. So plus you need your data inputs and then you might need your analytics. So I think there's a makeup of what, what is the perfect, there isn't a perfect tech stack. But there are definitely needs that you have. And I think the skill set in marketing now of being able to know which of those work best for what company at what stage, what the investment level should be, and then how do you bring it together and integrate it is key, is key. I see, I was actually reading from an analyst, put something out at the end of last year, several reports on the rise of the marketing operations team and the need and the rise in the headcount on that because it, it's so needed. And I truly agree with that. Yeah, rise of marketing operations, rise of data operations is now a growing segment also. Those that know how to harness the data, all the different one, data points that's being ingested in a company, definitely growing really fast. When I hear you talk about video, it's really no different than any other aspect of marketing. As any time or money you're going to put into it, you're going to be asked the question, well, what's the ROI? What's the value? And that, that conversation specifically around content has been asked a lot and because we measure the value of the tactic all the time you know oh the tactic of the event or how much you're spending on content syndication or what are you spending on search engine it's not the tactic it's really how you're the content that you're putting out through those tactics to a certain audience so segmentation is important but the content is vital what objectives that fall under video is one of maybe 10 levers that you're pulling to traffic by X percent or you know whatever those larger objectives are. It's not the one thing. It's maybe the one out of eight things that, that you executed that helped meet this larger goal. And I do want to go back and underscore one thing that you said, and I, I wrote it down here and forgot to revisit it, is start with the audience and get alignment across the board on who we are looking to influence. And it sounds so elementary, like, yes, of course, it's about the audience. 
but we do PR for B2B SaaS companies. And there are times where we're surprised too, where there's not alignment between potentially the CEO and the CMO on who they're most looking to influence PR through PR, because most often it is customers, prospects. But then all of a sudden we'll get on the CEOs and be like, you know what? No, our number one focus is talent getting in front of potential a new team member. It's like, okay, well, those are way different strategies. But getting that initial alignment up front before you do anything, and, and that's not even as it relates to video marketers, that is from the start for anything is ensure that you have alignment on who you are looking to reach and getting that agreements across the board first is vital. So I did want to underscore that because you said it. That's what makes Mark the role so complicated because if I think about all of my audiences, obviously my priority is to how do I grow this business? And so that's got to be my customers and prospects. But then there's, to your point, current employees, future talent, current investors, future investors, analysts, there's a whole magnitude of audiences that you are needing to reach with all of your messages. And that's where I think if you haven't been a team, you don't appreciate the matrix of, look, you're given a budget and you're given a goal to hit and you've got all these things to try and do. And you've got all of these audiences internally to try and satisfy and help. And sometimes you can get two for one, but sometimes you have to be very focused and knowing where to bet, to put the bets. And it's actually the, the reason I took this role with Brightcove is I, as a marketeer, and it was in the pandemic, and I, like everybody else, was thinking, how am I going to break through? Like everybody's doing digital marketing. Everybody is overloaded with, because we, can't, we couldn't do events, right? So everything was digital. And how am I getting my message across? And when I was actually talking and interviewing with Bright Coven, it actually hit me. I'm like, oh my God, this is not talked about enough. People, this is the next thing for marketeers to think about is what's the most powerful way to get an audience attention? Whoever are those audiences we just talked about, it is through video. It's emotional. It's informative. It can make you take the next step. So, okay, so now I get video. Now, how do I use it to its best? Now, how do I build it into all my marketing mediums? How do I think about streaming? How do I think about doing something that is, is going to get the attention of these audiences in a way that my competition might not? Because if we can't keep doing the things we've always done. This has been a wealth of knowledge. You're a six-time CMO. How can people reach you if they have follow-up questions, need advice? Maybe they're thinking, my gosh, if I could just have her come in and help my company for 30 days, this would be awesome. How, how can people find you? Yeah, thank you. You can find me on LinkedIn, Jennifer Griffin Smith. Feel free to contact me through LinkedIn. We love to come out and really help clients understand what it means. What do they have now? What does their content look like? What might it look like? I'm actually building out, which I'm super excited about. I'm building out an advisory practice here at Bright Cove that is going to be able to come in and do audits on what you have, talk about benchmarks and KPIs, talk about what it means and what impact you might have on your ROI. And so that's really exciting. We've done some of that, but we're now building out the team and making that very programmatic. And I love to talk to my fellow marketeers and CMOs. Anybody that's in the Boston area knows I hold regular CMO dinners. And so if anybody's in Boston, any CMOs, and they want to know about that, please hit me up on LinkedIn too, because we're forever growing our community that we can all learn from each other, because I think that's so important. Very cool. Uh, well, this has been a great conversation. As I end every episode, I always ask our guests if they have a favorite or signature toast to send us out. Jennifer, do you have one? Oh, oh, that's good. What do I have a favorite toast? Um, no, I think just a big cheers. That's, that's just mine too. It's mine. <laughs> Ching ching. All good. Cheers. Cheers. Oh. Thanks to Jennifer for joining me on SAS Half Full. Great conversation. Hope you took a few things away. And for those of you who have listened to the very end of this episode, thank you. We have a new little segment for you called One More Drink, where I ask one question to our guests. And today's question was, what do you wish every CEO understood about marketing? That it's not as easy as just the creative. Thanks again for listening, and until next time, bottoms up.